Welcome to our voices. I have a special guest with me. She is the incumbent at large for City Council of Charleston, West Virginia. She's none other than Jennifer Clark. Jennifer, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Ray. How are you? I'm doing fine. Doing fine. Uh, the last time uh, you and I uh, did an interview, we were at the radio station uh, on, on my show. Yes, we Listen, were. Listening to some tunes. Yep. Uh, sure. You are, again, you, you are the at-large uh, council member for the city of Charleston. And so far, how's that coming along? It's, it's going well. You know, this is going to be a, it's going to be a tough primary. Um, and God willing, if I make it through the primary, it'll be a tough general. There, I believe, are 11 Democratic candidates that are running for the at-large seats. There are a total of six that will progress from the primary election, the top six. Um, then again, if I make it through the primary, the general would be, I think there's four Republican candidates and maybe one or two independent candidates. And from that pool, there will be six total that will be elected in the general election that will go on to serve for the four-year term. Okay. Um, I'm going to interview, this is about political series. I'm going to interview all of the candidates. Uh, um, I have interviewed uh, Jonathan Frazier. Uh, I'm going to interview uh, Council Council Member Lloyd. I'll call him Buford Lloyd more, BL, as you know, Big Lloyd. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I'm going to interview other folks like Beth Kearns, also uh, Martise Washington, and uh, Amy Goodwin as well. You ready to get started? Absolutely. Okay. First question, Jennifer, uh, what is the difference between when it comes to being a city council member, uh, a council member of a certain ward and at large, what, what's the difference between the two? Well, there are a total of 26 council members. There's six at large that represent the entire city. And then you have 20 ward representatives that represent their ward, like their neighborhood, I guess is the best way to say it. So once we did the redistricting there, again, the 20 wards, they represent about 17, 1800 people that are very close in proximity to where they live. So if you say you live in ward six, you could contact your council member, but you could also contact the at-large council member. When we vote, many times we're not just voting for a particular ward, we might be voting for something overall. So like for instance, uh, this up, um, one of the upcoming council meetings that we'll have, we'll vote for the city budget. Well, the city budget, it's dispersed again across the entire city. So you wouldn't have a ward representative that was just voting for their ward, they would be voting for the budget for the entire city of Charleston. Jennifer, uh, these past four years have been pretty uh, rocky for um, city council. Uh, uh, there was a storm of uh, the young lady that was assaulted by the police officer on the west side from a family dollar. Um, there were talks about that. Um, you know, of course, then there was the, the Crown Act uh, was passed by you all in city council. I mean, again, a lot of things that you all have done uh, as, a, as a governing body have, uh, have achieved. Uh, are there still some obstacles that the city of Charleston needs to uh, overcome? Well, sure. You know, we're on the, hopefully, on the tail end of the coronavirus pandemic and how disruptive that was for the past two, over two years. Um, there was so much momentum as far as economic development and revitalization, things of that nature before, you know, COVID-19. And that basically just halted so much. So th there's, there is much that still needs to be done. We have, you know, again, the economic opportunities that were, you know, on the precipice before the pandemic. But we also, you know, we have racial justice issues. We have you know, things that are going on with, um, as you know, my brother passed away of, a, of an overdose. We have the issue that we're, we're fighting with um, that, with drug addiction and how to handle it. 
And we're not unlike any other city. This happens in every city within the United States. But we, you know, it's close to home. We have an issue with population decline, keeping young people here. My son came home for spring break recently. We were in the car driving across the South Side Bridge and he said, mom, you know, I really miss this bridge. I miss this scenery. And he said, you know, there's, there's quite a bit that's changed since we moved here. And that's nice to hear that from it's promising. So, you know, trying to keep our young folks here, keep them engaged, good jobs, things of that nature. But again, that's, um, that's not unusual with any city within the United States. It's just, it's our home. So it, it rings very close. You speak of the uh, drug epidemic here. <clears throat> One of uh, the main uh, issues was the needle exchange. And again, I don't want to be the dead horse about this or try to badger anybody uh, concerning this issue. Um, where, where do you all stand? I mean, as, as far as city council, how, how far have you reached your goal into overcoming that? Well, I can only speak for myself. I, I think, and again, this sits very close to home with me. Um, you know, you and I have talked about this um, off air and just in private conversations. The crack epidemic was, you know, it hit people that look like me and you very hard. It um, hit very close to home. And um, there weren't very many resources that were available during that period of time. We fast forward to where we are now and there seems to be lots of resources, which I think is, is, is wonderful. Um, many people that I have talked that are in long-term recovery, I've asked them, what worked for you? And many of these folks were intravenous drug users. And they told me the accountability piece. You know, they, they really emphasized the point of having someone that if they needed, if, if they went to a place and you know, said, I'm still using, I would like to have clean needles. They were held accountable. If they took 10 needles, they brought eight, 10 back. It wasn't like they brought one or two back. And, and I think that with my brother specifically and, you know, other people that I know, I just don't want to harp on him, but other people that I know, they were, it became an issue with, um, what he was able to obtain and without being able to have the counseling that was needed. That was the piece that was missing for him and folks that look like us. So I'm very excited to see programs that are coming about that, that deal with helping our community and the community overall. But I just, do, I do know that there's a need and we have to create a balance and have the community buy-in so that it will be something that is long-term and effective. So Zion just walked in, say hi to Mr. Ray. I'm on a Zoom call. Hello. <laughs> Zion, how you doing, buddy? Good, how are you? All right. So when we talk about, now I'm going to bounce around from different subjects and everything. So you are in real estate. I see that uh, real estate has picked up in Charleston, uh, especially like lofts, uh, apartments, things like that. As are, are we, are we, again, a lot has changed in the past four years, mm -hmm. especially real estate. And again, that's, that's your, your, your niche right there. Um, how's that come along? It's coming along fantastic. Um, you know, the Atlas building, which I coordinated the leasing for that particular property, it was a long time in the making. It was a few years, and I'm not sure if, if how much people realize about that, but um, it was a historic building, and in order to get the historic tax credits, going through the State Historic Preservation Office, doing different things of that nature, that was before we even could start the construction. That was a few years in the making. Um, then it took about a year to get the, the building renovated. Well, we were able to lease that property. I think I leased it in like three months and it was completely full. I could have leased three Atlas buildings, the same space. There's 52 units, combination of efficiencies, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. I could have leased at least three of them and they could have been completely full when I was in the beginning stages. 
So now fast forward to, it's almost been about a year and a half. We have people that have started families. They have moved from out of state. Most of the people that did move here, they were from out of state. And now they're buying homes and they're relocating within the city of Charleston. Well, that's what you want when you have population decline and when you're trying to attract people here. Most people that live there, they love the fact that they can keep their car parked, they can walk to work if they you know, work downtown. If they work from home and remotely, they have a building that is accessible to much of anything. Uh, you have shopping, you have you know, movie theaters, you have all the activities that happen downtown Charleston. People can walk to that. And again, that's what you want. When you have folks that are spending money, if you have someone that goes to one of my favorite places is Black Sheep Burrito. Someone goes to Black Sheep or Rock City and they buy some food there. They may come back and go to a concert at Rock City. They may walk down the street and go to Ellen's and get some ice cream or they might walk across the street to Taylor Books and you know buy something that's in there, some pottery or books. That way your money continues to, it stays within the community and it passes so many times and that builds economic development and revitalization. So many of the projects that are underway to renovate some of the other buildings, there's like three or four that are going on right now. I believe the Atlas building was a catalyst for that. And we will see many more people with disposable income that want to spend their money and they'll spend it here instead of going out of state. And that's important, it's very important. Jennifer, I'm going to play a little uh, devil's advocate here. Based upon some of the conversations I've had with different folks in the city of Charleston, some say that, and I'm going to ask this question, same question to Amy Goodwin as well. Some say that the real estate uh, renovations, the, the, the turnaround, like the Alice building, which is great, but where does that leave folks that's uh, low income. Is this, is this a form of gentrification? Well, it's interesting that you ask that because one of the items that's on um, the horizon is the renovation of the Charmco building. I'm not sure if you're familiar with where that is, but that's directly, it's adjacent to the power park. And that is being um, slated for um, low income housing. Then you also have uh, there's another building downtown Charleston. I don't know if I'm at liberty of saying which building it is, but it's in close proximity. That's actually going to be low income housing for elderly folks over 55. So there are things that are on the horizon. It's just, it may not be that it's been discussed yet because there are certain things that are, they're held close until it's actually closed upon all of the permitting, all of the, the back office things, if you will, have to be taken care of before folks can actually say, this is what I'm doing. But those are on the horizon. Um, it's not that that has been left out. It just may be that it hasn't been announced yet, launched yet, or talked about as much, but it's there. One of the, one of the other issues uh, is the um, situation with the police. Uh, some folks still don't feel comfortable with the police. Has uh, relations between the community, especially the Black community and the police, has that gotten any better? I think so. Um, I like Chief Tyke quite a bit. Um, he's in the community. He wants to be around folks so that they, so that kids can, at a very early age, become familiar and comfortable with the police where they might see him, you know, on the playground, handing out ice cream, you know, having conversations, going into the schools, things of that nature. You know, um, you, you, you've probably had this conversation with your son as much as I've had it with my son. You know, we call it the talk. You know, we, we have that conversation. We, it was something that we had when we grew up and it's something that we continue to have. I yeah. think being familiar with certain folks that are in positions of authority like the police or positions of authority like judges or positions of authority like, you know, people that are on city council. I think the one great thing that we have in this community is that we're not too far removed from people that are in those positions. You see them in the grocery store. They live in your neighborhood. They, they, come, to the, they come to the football games and the basketball games. 
you can actually reach out and have conversations with them. I, I don't know if I had that much of an opportunity in the other cities and metropolises that I've lived in. Um, that's one of the things that I like about this community is that I can say, you know, do you know this person if I don't know them and get in touch with them? I think many things that we can do in order to overcome some of the issues and problems that we have is just having effective communication. And again, that's just by being seen, being around and starting those conversations. Jennifer, you have a successful four-year term. You're running for re-election. What does the future hold for Jennifer? I don't know, Ray. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, I really don't know. You know, you know my situation where, you know, we've suffered quite a bit of loss with, with several family members that, that passed away within a very short period of time and then other people that we love that were like family. And um, when you, you know, suffering that type of cumulative loss and grief, it's really put a different perspective on what I give my energy to and why I give that energy. You know, I, I want to make sure that my son is a, a responsible citizen and a responsible person and just try to pour everything that I can into him. My niece, she's become like a daughter now. She's the brother that I speak of. That was her father. She's lost both her parents and her sister within two and a half years. So she and I share something in common where we lost the family that we were born into. I don't have brothers and sisters and parents and neither does she, but we've got each other. And um, that's important to me. So family is important. Being in a community where I feel like um, I'm valued and that I can add value to that community, reciprocating that, that's important to me. I, I really hope that I can continue to earn the votes and respect of people within the community, uh, continue to do things like we previously talked about with the interruption with coronavirus. I just you know, want to pick up where we left off. I want to see these uh, non-courts for basketball and volleyball in the convention center. I want to see how much economic development and, and ec economic impact that can bring into the community. I want to continue to have conversations like what we did with the renaming, the honorary street renaming of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Way and how that brought so many different communities together, learning more about the Triangle District and the Block District and playing, paying homage to those that helped to build this city. And then also, you know, again, helping those within the service industry with uh, the initiative I started with uh, Bernie Lane and Tony Piranzino that was Better Together CWV. That was really impactful for service, those that worked in the service industry that were truly impacted by coronavirus and they couldn't serve, they couldn't do a number of things. And to see how the community gathered to raise money to just help people pay basic things like their rent and utilities and food. Those are things I just want to see if we can build upon and just to try to make this community the best that it can be. And while I'm here to just keep serving and, and trying to do good. Um, really trying to do good. Just want to get off subject here. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I know you've been busy. You've been, you know, going here, going there. You've been handling your business, and I, I know that. Again, uh, the deaths in your family. Again, I mean, it was just one after another. After, and I mean, I, I, I'll be honest, and I just. Shook my head disbelief. I was like, "Damn!" I mean, this, you know, just. And again, my 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 thoughts and prayers are with you and your family uh, during this time. Um, I, I know it's, it's a hard grieving process, and I've been there. I I, I know what it's like, and I'm I'm with you. You know, I'm with your spirit. Thank you. Going back to the the landscape of Charleston. So you're looking at one of the, 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 the glaring needs, well, not needs, but one of the glaring issues uh, people still fuss about is Tent City. And some folks say, well, you know what? They're not bothering anybody. Why take it down? Well, I think I, I can give you 
I can give you a real life scenario. Um, and we'll, we'll take this back to the Atlas building. When we were in the process of waiting for all of those permits and to be able to say, let's go ahead and start, I received several telephone calls where there were people that were inside of the property and going inside of that property and seeing things that I saw. I can't unforget those things. <laughs> you know, I can't re erase those from my mind. And when you have people that go into private properties, it's one thing if someone's trying to get shelter. I get that. I mean, uh, I, I can remember very distinctly a conversation I had with my dad when I was a young girl. And there was a gentleman that was standing outside. It was very close to a holiday and he had a sign. And he said, you know, he, he needed money for his family for a holiday. And my dad and I, we were tasked by my mother to go pick up food from Kroger. And he pulled that guy to the side and the guy started crying and hugging my dad. And I couldn't hear what he was saying. And my dad took all of the groceries out of our car and gave them to him. And he said, you know, Jenny, if you ever, he always called me Jenny. He was like, Jenny, if you ever see someone that's in that, help them. In a situation like that, help them. Because most people don't want to stand outside and beg for something if they truly need it. And that, that's never left me. But when you fast forward to situations like I was talking about going into the Atlas building, when you have property owners that walk in and they see defecation smeared on the walls and, and you know, we're just having a real conversation. So I'm just being honest with you. When you see defecation smeared on the walls, when you see syringes that are all over the floor, when you see food that is not thrown away in a trash can that's two steps away, or things that are spilled on the floor, soiled clothing, things of that nature, the property owner has to clean that up. That's their responsibility to clean it up. If there's copper that's taken out of their building, if there's things that are stolen, they have to replace those things. So I understand both sides of the coin. So it's to the point where we have to find a happy medium, but we also have to get community buy-in because people don't want their property destroyed. And at the same time, they want to help people that are truly in need. So that's the balance. And that's what we have to work towards. And I hope that makes sense. Yes, it does. It makes sense to me. Um, you know, again, I said a lot of folks, some folks, well, some, they say, well, just leave them alone. Leave, leave them be. You know, they're not bothering anybody. Um, let's, let's, let's move on to another area. Um, well, back to, back to the drug situation. It seems like it, it has calmed down. It really, it really does. Um, we, we talked about the needle exchange. You know, we, 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 we talked about that, but, but now we're looking at it's kind of quiet now. Again, that that's that's a that's a great thing in Charleston, unless it's something that's undercover. You know what I mean? So, where do we stand on the issue of the drug epidemic? Has it calmed down? Well, I I, I don't know necessarily if it's calmed down. Um, I think that we know that there's a need to help people that that need the help. We, we, I mean, I see that. And again, I can only speak for myself and the vote that I'm able to cast and, and the opportunities that I'm able to go and, and to speak with people. Um, I'll give you a prime example. Um, one of the things that I talked about quite often was people that look like me and you that were getting help. Um, and again, this goes back to my family and the addiction that has been in my family for decades. This just didn't start, you know, like two, three years ago. This has been going on for quite some time. It's we're starting to talk about it now. We're starting to have programs for it now. Again, I can go back to the crack epidemic and how that affected folks that look like me and you more than affected other people. But there weren't programs that were out. There were people that, that dealt with things that Folks are dealing with now, but there's more resources. Um, okay, but no, 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 there was a program for us back in the day. There was a program. It was, it was, it was jail. prison. It was prison, yeah. Go it ahead. was Sorry. Yeah. yeah, that was a program. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about help that keeps you out of places like that. And, you know, the family members that, okay, yeah, you yeah. know, that suffered, you know, like that suffered where, it, it, and again, what I guess what I'm saying is this isn't new. We're talking about it more now. There's more programs to keep people out of jail and out of prison. But, you know, folks that look like me and you, they went to jail for an eight ball and they stayed in there for 10, eight, seven years, something like that. You know, family members had things that were stolen from them back then. But now we're starting to actually talk about it to the point where people want to keep their loved ones out of prison and jail. Um, I think uh, there are programs that are taking place, places in communities that are helping. And I think more people are reaching out to those programs. So that could be why we're seeing less um, activity than what we saw before, but I think it's still happening. It's just, I think, um, I, again, I just think people are taking advantage of more. And, I, and again, that comes from conversations. I, it's a lot of pain to talk about what I've experienced. It's, you'll not ever forget finding a loved one dead. You'll, you'll, I mean, I'll never get that image out of my head of finding my brother dead. Well, his, my niece found him, but when I went to her house and to see him, um, it's something, it's ingrained in my mind. Uh, we're working through the pain, but it's to the point where I would never want anyone to experience what we've experienced. So I talked to my niece and I said, would it bother you if I talked about my brother, your dad? And she said, no, we want to help other people to not have to go through what we've been through. But that comes from some very candid conversations and people really trying to understand and compromise and collaborate. If that doesn't happen, we're not going to make the progress. But I do agree with you. I think things, I think more people are getting help. Um, do I, you know, there's some per, other folks that would, that would beg to differ with me. But I see more people that I know that are calling me and thanking me for the conversations that I'm having because their loved ones are now starting to get into programs. And, and that's all that I could ask for. Jennifer, are you, is the city of Charleston looking into uh, building more treatment facilities? Um, I don't know definitively if it's, if there's been locations that have been identified or been passed. I guess that's what I could say. I don't know of anything that's been passed in council as far as uh, the building of those or to have funding for those. But I, I mean, I do know that we need more. We need more than, West Virginia Health Rate does a great job. I don't know if you've been over to their facility on the west side and what Shayla Leffridge and Angie Settle have been able to do on the west side of Charleston and the number of people that they've been able to help. Um, there's a young woman by the name of Nakia, I think her last name is Austin or Thomas, I'm so sorry. Um, she's on the west side and she's doing, I went over to visit with her. I walked out, there were 15 people waiting to have a group session and the majority of them looked like me and you. And I was so happy to see that because unfortunately, as you know, in our community, historically, we haven't talked about things. It's kind of swept under the rug. Um, but there are people that are bringing about good programs and we need more of that because we know we have a problem. I recently spoke with uh, Reverend Watts and we talked about the issues of uh, funds uh, that's supposed to go with these bills that have been passed by the legislature and it's supposed to help communities like the West Side. Um, he also indicated that there was a certain amount of money that came to the city of Charleston and he spoke highly of uh, Mayor Amy Goodwin, how she was pretty transparent in the money. So as far as the money that the city received, has that been allotted yet as far as like, you know, it's in waiting, in use, in, in waiting to be used or has it been used up yet? Um, that's a great question. Um, there's been some misinformation that has been circulating on social media. And also I, I told a few friends recently, I always know when something's going on in the community because my phone lights up like a Christmas tree. It just starts ringing and texting and things like that. 
the money for the American Rescue Funds, uh, I believe the city of Charleston, it was it was 31 or 38 million. I always get them transposed, so I'm a sorry. Um, that there has been a select committee that's been working on those funds for over a year. Um, the recommendations have been made. There's quite a bit that has been allocated for the west side of Charleston. Um, those will actually come up for vote. We, I thought we were going to vote on it on the meeting on the 7th of March, but actually the meeting that will take place on the 21st of March is when we'll vote for the ones that were allocated towards nonprofits. So the recommendations have been made. Um, it has not been approved through all of council yet. I think that's something else if we can just take a second to talk about this for a second, right? I think many times people get confused with how the process works with council. It, it becomes, it's introduced at a council meeting, then it goes to committee. At committee, it's discussed, passed, then it comes back to council for full vote. So if it makes it to the committee, that doesn't mean that it's set in stone. It still has to go back to council for a full vote. And many times I have, not many times, but sometimes I have seen items that have made it through committee that get to council and they don't make it through council and then it's it's not approved. Okay, I let, do me, let, let, let me pause right to start sure. I mean, I'm sorry. So when you say committee, when you say committee, describe committee, because again, you, you say there are 26 council members and yeah. the mayor. So we'll say the committee on, um, we'll say, uh, parks and Recreation. Yes. Who's on that? Who's on that committee? Who is the chair? And tell 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 the viewers the functions. And again, you you tell them the functions. Give the viewers a visual of the committee and and, and how does that work again, please? Okay, sure. So I'll give you. I'm I'm on Planning Streets and Traffic. So on the Planning Streets and Traffic Committee, Councilwoman Mary Beth Hoover is the chair of planning streets and traffic. I uh, believe the co-chair is Councilwoman Naomi Bates. Then you have uh, council president separately, myself, uh, Councilman Brady Campbell, Councilman Bobby Haas, and I believe um, Councilman Adam Knopf. So of that committee, three are at large, four are ward representatives. So let's take, for instance, uh, the street renaming, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the honorary street renaming. That was presented to council. It went to planning streets and traffic committee because it's a street sign, a street name. It goes to that particular committee. Um, and actually, I think, went to the Board of Zoning Appeals as well, or Municipal Zoning Board. Um, and it was voted on there as well. So that be, I believe that committee is made up of um, residents within the city of Charleston and Mary Beth Hoover sits on that committee as well since she's the uh, chair of Planning Streets and Traffic. That bill came before the Planning Streets and Traffic. It was approved or um, uh, it passed by majority vote and then went back to city council for all 26 of us to vote on and the mayor because the mayor gets a vote. So while it was going, while it was on the floor at council floor, if say 14 people voted against it and 13 voted for it, that would not have passed and then it would not have come to be. So that's how that process takes place. Most of the work that's done with city council happens on committees. So with the American Rescue Funds, for instance, there was a select committee because a select committee is a committee that's not typically in existence. So planning streets and traffic is a committee that is part of city council. Facilities is part of city council. Um, parks and rec is part of city council. But things that are outside of that, like these, this funding that came about from the federal government, that's a select committee. I'm on a select committee for insurance. Um, I'm on a select committee for the renaming, renaming rights for the convention center. So all of those are not standing committees. Those are special committees, but that's how the process works. You explained to me good right there. I, <laughs> again, a lot of folks don't know. I halfway knew, but you cleared it up for me. So I'm, I'm glad. Thanks. Because thank sometimes it's confusing. It's, it's really, and I think most people, 
Mm -hmm. I tell people to come to the committee meetings, come to the council meetings and stay to the end because that's when we have our remarks sec sec section. And you can hear things and people may say why they voted a certain way, what something that's upcoming. It's, it's very engaging. Some folks will come to council, they'll stay for the, the part that, that, that is of interest to them and then they leave. But towards the end is when I feel like you get quite a bit of information. Well, you know, as the old saying goes, you know, one bad apple can spoil a bunch or one bad situation can spoil the whole thing. You know, there have been times in the past where uh, you all are in council, uh, the topic could be something and they say, okay, well, let's table this till next time. Let's table this. You know, it's kind of, let's put it to a vote now. It's, you know, some, some folks want to table it, you know, keep kicking the can down the road. So that's why, you know, it's, I mean, I guess it's kind of hard for folks to really want to sit in on a committee meeting to see what is going on. You follow me? I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Because, yeah. um, I mean, of course, I believe that more folks will be apt to attend a council meeting. But again, I guess they don't know about the committee meetings. Um, is that something that's posted that people can look forward to, to checking out? Oh, absolutely. It's um, anything that has to come up for a vote or that, that goes to a committee, um, we have to post it, I believe it's three days ahead of time. Um, certain things require a public hearing. So that information is readily available on the website, on the city's website, but it's also discussed in city council where uh, like the new bills or the new resolutions or new things of that nature or new business, that is the latter part of council. And once it's introduced, the mayor will say, um, uh, recommend to or, or, or send to planning streets and traffic. And those are things that are that take place towards the latter part of council. But it is it's all public information and it has to be posted. And I believe, again, that's a th it's a three day minimum that it has to be posted. OK, I'm pretty much done. <laughs> I, have one more, I have one more question. Now, of course, I want you to fill in the blanks. I mean, it's, if there's something I haven't touched on that you feel like you want to talk about, that's fine. Now, I'm going to give you three minutes. Here's my final question. Why should the city of Charleston vote for Jennifer Farr? I'm going to give you three minutes, okay? Three minutes. All, All right. right. Well... I think one of the reasons is, and again, again, I'm very thankful to have been able to have served for the past little over three years. I'm a firm believer in economic development and revitalization. It's something I'm incredibly passionate about. I work tirelessly on the issues that um, I present to council and also the ones that are presented in order for me to vote on. I believe that I'm fair. I think one of my best qualities is that I listen. I try not to interrupt people. I try to let them finish what it is that they have to say. And I think about it, not just from my perspective, but by the perspective of what they've presented to me. I'm involved in a number of community organizations. I enjoy being in the community. And I, mean, I love Charleston. I've lived all over and I've come back home and I thought I'd be here for six months and my son fell in love with rabbits, deers, and squirrels, and all things Nana, and we decided to stay. And um, I think more people that are like you and I, Ray, that have lived other places and we choose to live here, we want it to be the best that it can be. I think the more that we do that, we can start talking about uh, changing the narrative about what we don't see, but what we do have. And again, going back to my 19-year-old son's conversation that he's gone away to school and come back and what he misses and what he sees that has progressed. We want to have more people here and I want to work to make this a better place. Not just to sit on council to say that I sit on council, but to put in the work day in and day out, being approachable and just trying to, to, to make it again, the best that it can be. So if people see my name on a ballot, I hope that they will circle it again. I'm one of six that will, um, there's six that will be elected. I hope to be one of the six that six that make it through the primary. And just for people to know that I'm available and again, just wanna make this place the best that it can be. So if 
folks do vote for me, I'll be greatly appreciative and I will put in the work. All right. Now, of course, you, there's your, your kickoff campaign starts tomorrow from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Talk about that. So my kickoff campaign, again, is going to be at one of my favorite places in all of Charleston, Black Sheep Burrito, Kevin Madison there does an outstanding job. He and Morgan Morrison that are the owner of Rock City Cake Company, they were responsible for Holly Jolly Brawley, which was the celebration that took place over Christmas with all the Christmas trees and Brawley Walkway. He does so much for this community and has become such a good friend of mine. He's, uh, they have a private banquet room there. Hopefully many people of many different cultures and beliefs and backgrounds and ages, they'll be there and folks will be able to hear what it is that I want to do, be able to mingle and network with some other folks, which I think many people have wanted to do for so long. And now we're finally getting to a point where we can do that. And again, just for folks to be able to come out and talk with me in person, um, I can listen to what they, their concerns are, um, aspirations that they have to make this, make Charleston the best place that it can be. And for us to just mingle and kick off the campaign and hopefully it'll be a successful campaign. Ms. Jennifer Parr, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, Councilwoman at large, Ms. Jennifer Parr, I uh, thank you very much for coming to our voices. You take care, pretty safe, okay? I appreciate you, Ray. Thank you so much for having this platform for, for me and for everyone else. All right, don't go anywhere. Hold on. All Welcome back to Our Voices. I have another special guest with me. He is an incumbent city, out, city at large council member here in Charleston, West Virginia. Ward now, he, I'm sorry, for Ward 4. Ward 4, my, my correction, my apologies, for Ward 4. He is the councilman for Ward 4. They call him Big L. <laughs> okay, now to me, BL, my, my government name to him. I call him Buford Lloyd Moore. Mr. Moore, how you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, Ray. I appreciate this to get out and just to get my voice heard. I, I thank you so much. Now, for the record, please tell the viewers, listeners, your government name. Okay, it's Larry Moore, Ward 4. My, my slogan is Larry Moore for Ward 4, changing the narrative. So that's going to be my, that's my campaign slogan. All right, four more, okay. You ready to get started? Yes, sir. I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. Now, Larry, you uh, again, you have been appointed to that position. You've replaced uh, young lady uh, Tiffany. Yeah, Wesley Pleer. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, wonderful young lady. Uh, oh, she's the best, man. That's like one of my best friends, man. Yes. Love her. Though. Yes, yes, yes. And again, you have been appointed to that position. Um, before we talk about the work, Okay. Please tell folks something about Larry Moore. Well, like I said, I'm a West Side resident. You know, I went to Glenwood Elementary, Stonewall Jackson Junior High at the time, Capitol High School, uh, went to Marshall University, got my undergrad from Marshall, got a master's degree from Marshall. I got a master's degree from Virginia State University. I work at a Capitol High School where I teach. Well, now I'm an interventionist, dean of students. Uh, well, I did teach special ed for 10 years. 11 years since I switched over. I coach football, I coach track, and then I'm also a, a member of uh, Keep Your Faith Corporation. 
Okay, you're also a member of a certain um, a youth group. What it was that that, that okay. boys club? No, 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 no. That, that, that boys club. You're 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 a member, aren't you? Oh, oh, yeah. Excuse me. Uh, yes, sir. I'm a member of the Mega Side Five Fraternity Incorporated, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. The, the, the boys group. club, okay. I, I just, organization. just organization. a great organization, you know what I mean? Represent my guys, you know. Okay, but just remember now, just just say the second 1911. Just just go and say it like that. <laughs> no, sir, no, sir. You're not gonna say that? No, sir. I'm not gonna say that, no, sir. You th you're not gonna admit it? I, I don't listen, I don't, man. Listen, you know, hey. Be Beaufort, come on now. Hey, I mean, you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Let's, let's do this. Um, Larry, when yes, you sir. were appointed uh, councilman for Ward 4, did you have any concerns about stepping into that role of being a councilman? Yeah, because like when they came to me about doing it, because I'm already, I, I'm so busy doing stuff. My whole thing was the concern of like this my time and being able to help out and when people needed me and stuff. But then like Tiffany reminded me, she was like, you're already doing it already anyway. From what I've already been, I'm so active in the community, helping people, doing what I do. So I kind of thought about it. I was like, well, yeah. You, and, and it was a good choice because now I can do more being on this platform where I'm at. So after I sit and thought about it for a minute, I was like, it's a good choice. So I'm, I'm kind of glad I did it. Okay. Um, so you, so you, you're up for the challenge, uh, you, you, you take it ahead on and you have produced positive results for your neighborhood. Have there been any setbacks or any obstacles along the way while you have been appointed to the position of councilman? Well, not, not yet, but it's coming. Like I know, right. Well, I know without the, all right, the AARP money, like funding and stuff. And uh, I know the low build homes they're trying to put up. So I, I mean, that's coming around, but we haven't had that discussion in council yet. But uh, so far, since I've been in in June, I've uh, I've really, you know, I've I've had a few like nothing really major. Like they built the uh, playground, which is a great great thing. Nothing really, you know, what I'm saying nothing nothing that's come, you know, that's been hard to deal with right now as the point. But I know things are always going to come around the way. But um. So far, it's been, you know, nothing too, nothing too, uh, I say, strenuous or not. Larry, describe Ward 4. Uh, some people may not understand the, the geographical area uh, within Charleston. So describe Ward 4 as far as the boundaries that you represent. Okay. Well, Ward 4 is on the west side of Charleston. And it, um, I border with Ward 6, so Central Avenue going west to I was over from Central Avenue to Route 21 and Hutchinson Street and Orchard Manor but we had rezoned recently so now my um borders getting cut back I'll probably just be to Little Page I won't cross the bridge anymore going over to like that part but um if you come like down Washington Street all the way down to like Little Page till you get to Orchard Manor and from uh, Glenwood down to the boulevard on the west side of Central Avenue. That's where I'm at located. So like I have like a, if anybody's familiar with Copley's like um, going to Patrick Street but I don't have Patrick Street but I cut off right there. Like the, the cut is kind of different but like Taco Bell rallies that area over that way. Larry uh, this redistricting uh, done by the legislature uh, a lot of people have expressed their frustration over it. The new map, has it, I mean, does it hinder you or does it help you as far as this re-election process? Well, because I really didn't lose too much. I, I kind of, I wish, I, I, I enjoyed having part of Orchard Manor and that part of Route 21, but it didn't really hinder me because I didn't lose many of my uh, constituents. I pretty much, I just kept my same area. It just cut me back a little bit. And I mean, so I really, for me, I didn't lose anything, which is good. You know what I mean? So it kept, it kind of, I still have my same constituents, the same people I've been helping. But, you know, I, I don't mind like venturing like outside, outside my box. If I had to move the little area a little further, I would, I don't mind at all. 
because I mean I'm here to help the people. Uh, Larry, um, I've asked uh, Jennifer for this question. I brought this up to her, and we'll bring this up to you. Mm -hmm. uh, recently interviewed Reverend Watts. Yes. Uh, there was concerns about monies that was supposed to go to the uh, go to some of these uh, bills that have been passed by the legislature. Again, the, the legislature never funded it. And it was supposed to go to certain areas like the West Side. Mm -hmm. um, are you still facing an uphill battle as far as trying to get funding for projects in your area? Have you reached out to the delegates? Well, um, I know with some of the AARP money, I know a few groups that are active in the West Side had got passed for the funding. So like... Uh, and it's been for years, even before, I'm, even growing up, I know the Cura money, this is like, I remember 20 years ago, they had a plan that never came to fruition. And uh, certain parts of the West Side benefited more than other parts. And um, I know before I came on council, we had a, a meeting at the city, I mean, with the city, and we all came, people from my, from my neighborhood and the community where I live, we talked about like funding issues and stuff. So like, you know, that's been kind of, I know that's still been an ongoing thing going on. But I know like with the AARP money that they just passed, I know a few organizations that are active in the West Side have got, well, got passed for funding. And I know it's, it's an uphill battle. And this, I mean, the West Side is like, it's a, it's an eclectic place, man. And people don't understand like how it is. It's so big, yet certain areas get plighted. And that's been systematically done for years. If you ever go back and like look at the map of the West Side from back, back to like the early 1900s, it's, it was always a very highly segregated place and the certain area that was most segregated suffered the most and still to this day suffers the most. Larry, how do you, what's your plan as far as changing that, uh, that, that stigma of segregation? And you're right. Uh, when it comes to the West side, we talk about the haves versus the have nots because <clears throat> Edgewood alone is a community within a community. It's just they're by themselves. Oh, I mean, but 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 once but once you step out of Edgewood and, and come on to like Washington Street on down, you know, it's like yeah, it's a, it's a different world. But it's it's, it's kind of like they're lacking stuff. But again, but when it comes to uh, uh, things for Edgewood, it's it's immaculate. You know, just. I mean, have, have you, has any of your constituents ever came to you with that issue? Well, yeah, it's like, all right, a prime example is the Elk City situation. Like, it's with the cure money. Because, all right, when they came and they, re, uh, you know, revitalized that area of the West Side and called it Elk City, like, you know, it they everything publishes Elk City. You don't see the West Side. Only time you hear the West Side on it is something bad that happens over there. But when it's something good, it's Elk City. You're doing some Elk City. Elk City this, Elk City that, Elk City. And then, like, the other part, like, you go past Washington Street, you get closer down towards, like, going towards, um, you get past West Side Middle School. Like you said, it, it, that money funded for them business area, it hadn't got the same love that Elk City, well, I, I'm going to call it West Side, but the Elk City District has got, even, like, near Five Corners, there are, um, like, where um, them two brothers at, and they put health right, that area, you know, still didn't have, like, you know, it's getting, I guess, we're trying to get some stuff over there for it, too, but, like, and that's my, that's not my ward, but, you know, I, I hate get caught in that. See, one thing about it, I don't really get caught in ward because, like, I'm a West Side Charleston guy, so I'm support all the West Side. As I say, you know, I don't just be like, I'm a ward forward. Don't know because I believe that all, you know what I'm saying, it benefits the whole West Side and benefits the whole city of Charleston when the whole area is doing great and doing good. But you can see, like, you know, like, I mean, it's like a whole different world. Like, you get, like you said, it's not, you get past, he said, you get past uh, Park Avenue, get to Park Avenue, and you keep going farther down, like, you get closer to, like, all right, the lower income housing units, like, where Little Page is at um, uh, Orchard Manor. Like, even, like you said, became a food desert. Because when Save a Lot closed down, that whole area closer to, like, where, uh, off of Park Avenue going towards, like, the Boulevard and Glenwood Avenue and all that, it's a food desert. You know, they, they just opened, recently opened up a, a dollar. We have a family dollar and a dollar general across the street from each other. I mean, I mean, and like we were talking about healthy foods and whatnot. So you're still getting people the same processed food. And, you know, people in our neighborhood and our community have high risk of diabetes, heart, um, heart disease, kidney diseases and whatnot. So food is a major factor and able to 
to get good like fresh produce and stuff is it's a it's a must and it makes healthy living and people will have to walk and the walk we had estimated the walk time from like say there's a living where Glenwood Elementary used to be at it's a um assisted living that's just a bit of uh, income based living apartments and the walk from there to Kroger's is man it's it's crazy so and you can just see like you can say like certain areas like it and it's and it's been a change that for the last 20 years like even from when I was growing up I grew up over there so from when I was growing up to now, it's, it's changed tremendously, a, a whole lot. Larry, can you talk to, okay, because again, you say you're West Side, period, no matter what. And when it comes to the West Side, there are, I guess it, it overlaps in two wards, is that correct? Well, it's four, four, four. really five, really almost five wards in the West Side, technically, you got Westmoreland area. That way you have the Westmoreland area, Bigley Avenue, then you have like the two wards on the west side hill. You have the Edgewood district, then you have over going uh, west on the west side hill. Then you have the flats, like where I'm at, like one side of the flats, other side of the flat. Because the west side is like the biggest area in the city of Charleston. Larry, when we when you look at that, um, look at the west side. Mm -hmm. Say uh, there's something going on in an area that you're familiar with, but that's not your territory. Yes. Uh, is it a cardinal sin or cardinal rule that you cannot go over there and uh, offer any advice or, or offer any, any uh, assistance uh, to those residents if they're not in your ward? You can't. You can't do that, can you? Or no. no. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, uh. Not because, like, I mean, I've got phone calls from people who don't live. Like, a lady just called me recently, and she seen my um article in the paper. And she called me and was like, you know, and then I, like, well, you, where do you live at? And she was like, I live, I said, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to help you out. And my thing is this, I'm a city representative. So I'm here to serve the city and serve the people. So like, you know, I don't like go over to people. It's like, I wouldn't go to your ward and be like, you need to do this. You need to do that. But if somebody would call me, I'm going to help the person out, help people out. But, you know, we sit and talk together because we have to work together. And in order for us to make the West Side a great place, we have to work together. So nobody wins when the family feuds. So like I try to stay on a good like basis with everybody so we can help us get the funding and item and funding and things that we need over here on our part of town. So I um it's always open door. I mean, like all the all our the councilmen from the west side, we all get along real well. So it's a great situation we have with each other. Larry, um the drug issue. Oh, okay. Is there a drug issue still going on? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's like, I'm oh, sorry. And, and, and what is it, uh, what what has been done? Well, I know, like, before I even, like, well, I can just talk to change. I'm just growing up. I'm being honest with you. Like, when I grew up, when I was a little kid, it was the crack, crack epidemic. So, and I remember my friends, like, I had a lot of my friends who, that came up through it and had to suffer through it. And the, the thing to me that is, is just like the, how they, they view it now. Like I have friends that what used to like parents would happen, things would happen and they would get sent to school and they would like, the kids were going through like trauma and situations and they would just get treated like, you know, it was like, well, you just got to suck it up and you know, this and this and that. And these guys, and these guys are now, we're 40 years old, but most of my friends have suffered through trauma just because of what they had to live through. And then like, and their parents, too, and majority of the people that, that were in my neighborhood that were, you know, were of African-American, you know, descent and, you know, black people. So their parents got treated different or people that we knew got treated different. Like, I remember, like, getting arrested. Like, I was seeing drug addicts get arrested and catch felony charges for being, you know, for addicted, being addicted to crack. But now, since the drug has changed, like, now it's the um, opioid, opioid epidemic and, like, Majority of people now are not really even from the West Side or this from they coming over this way. And like they're the ones like, you know, you know, kind of breaking into the houses and you know, uh just doing all kind of, you know, just outside like, you know, the signs up and stuff. And it's just the treatment is different too. And this is like that's I mean, you know, I'm all about getting people help and whatnot, but just you know, it's just like I just I just, you know, it's just I don't know, just the, the treatment issue of it all, because like, you know, like it's just because I know people right now are still suffering that caught felonies from being a drug addict that has felonies on the record right now. Couldn't get housing, couldn't get 
just simple things because you're a felony, but you caught a felony because you were a drug addict, not because you were selling drugs. You know, and that's like the thing, you know, that's the only thing I see as the, the difference too. Like, you know, like I remember like even like the whole needle exchange issue, like when they came to over in our neighborhoods and stuff and was giving up the needles. And like they never really talked to anybody in the neighborhood how they felt about it. And you know, like you said, we all for help. I mean, no, you know, I want people to be helpful. I don't want, you know, people out here, you know, but you gotta come and talk to the people in the neighborhood. And that's one thing that happens too. They think that, you know, just because we live on the West Side, they think that, you know, everybody, you know, like I said, it's an eclectic, it's an eclectic place. Now everybody's monolithic over there. So you got to speak to the people before, you know, make an assumption, you know, before you group everybody in, in a box. Larry, the uh, issue of real estate and housing, how is that looking? See, like, that's one thing about it, too. It goes back to systematic stuff. Because, like, what happened, like, they recently... Like even before we I got on council, they had sold like a bunch of land and they um built these multi like living multi layer multi like I say level living units, and uh we were under assumption at one point in time that they were going to you know be like RTOs because like the only way you're going to like all right it's back to the situation in your neighborhood like how you change your neighborhood is about ownership so like I'm I'm an advocate of this of home ownership. Because when you own your home, you take more pride in it. You take more pride in your neighborhood. You take more pride in cleaning up. You make you take more pride in strangers in your neighborhood. People, you just it's a sense of community that you take pride in. But when you build these multi-unit homing, like these multi-unit like living spots, it's a turnover rate. People don't really care. I mean, then they change the zoning of the houses. So like now, this would be a certain space you had to have between your apartment, these houses. Now these units are put like right close to houses. So like you've been living in the house 50 years, Mr. Uh, you know, Ray. And all of a sudden a zoning got changed. Now they put these multi-layer unit, multi-living units beside you. Forbid something bad happens, but the whole block's gonna go down. You know what I mean? And I, you know, I don't, you know, it's just like we need more like RTO options and less like, you know, this apartment turnover rates. You know, what I mean, you live in an apartment for two or three months and go. People in and out, in and out, in and out. But you need to start making, you know, staying establishing people that want to come and stay in the community and like live and like own a house and just take pride in it. Cause the whole, I mean, you can just tell certain neighborhoods when you go to certain neighborhoods and they have like people that own houses or, you know, it's a, it's a more private thing, more prideful into their neighborhood. And they're more, they're more like, you know, resilient about fighting for things. And people don't understand sometimes that even though if you're a renter, people don't think you can voice your, your, your opinion about things. There's renter rights too. So then they get lost in that too. And that hurts us because a lot of people who rent, they don't think they can sp speak up about things that go in their neighborhood, like about when they put these apartments over there. And like, they don't think they can speak on them because they rent, but you still have your voice need to be heard and people don't know that. So, I mean, like, like, you know, it's, and it's kind of like, you know, I mean, I, I said about helping people, nothing wrong at all, but help these people become um, homeowners, like the RTOs, because that's what it is. It's systematic. I'm saying that's what it is. It's, it builds, um, what, I'm, what I'm looking for, uh, wealth you know what i'm saying generational wealth because you know once you own property on land or something something you can pass down to family members or whatnot and then if you need to be you can use that that uh, property for equity if you want to get another loan if you want to open something up you just need some type of equity or whatever just a base to have and that's what we um that's what i'm about you know i, I, I really like to push it's like ownership of land home ownership larry you say that um you're all about pushing home ownership. Yes. Okay. So when we talk about home, we talk about the homeless. Yeah. Are you are, are, are you having a problem with that? And if so, what is what is the plan of action to rectify that? See, we're having that's what I'm saying. We're having a problem with the homeless bad. And like um, like because the other day I got calls from like a lot of them or like, you know, like, and it's like the difference to like like even the, the difference, there's different levels of homelessness. Like I remember like growing up, we had like the, it was like homeless guy named Aqualung and Aqualung never bothered anybody. Aqualung was like the people see, they would give him food. Aqualung would tell you stories. But nowadays we have more like of the homeless now. They don't like, it's not like they, more like he said, it's because of the drug. I mean, honestly, a lot of the homeless now, a lot of them are like, it's because of the drug epidemic. So like a lot of them, like people, you like, you have to want to get help. And if you don't want to get help, sometimes it's hard 
it's harder to make you like follow rules because a lot of people don't want to go into like these shelters because you have to follow certain rules. So like if you have to be in the house by a certain time or you have to follow certain rules, they don't want to do it. And I guess it's a hard, that's a hard thing because you got to distinguish between like, you know, the homeless, then who has the homeless and has like issues from mental health to drug addiction because everything's not the same and you have to decipher and figure out what, what role the first is. Like if you are homeless and you have a drug addiction, the drug addiction is going to take over everything you do. So that's going to be the main thing you have to get fixed. And if you have mental issues, sometimes you have to get the mental issues fixed first to figure out why. Because some people, like you said, you know, it's like, it's a hard thing to do. So you need services to handle all that. But then you also, you need facilities for that. So, I mean, the thing of it is, is trying to find a facility somewhere. And then too, and like, you don't want to be too intrusive in people's neighborhoods or whatnot. So that's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to deal with. Cause like, I mean, where I live on the West Side, everybody was like, well, you know, open on the West Side, put on the West Side. But people over here was like, well, don't don't flood it over to a certain nick of the area of the woods. You know, sometimes, you know, branch out, you know, a different area. And then, too, a different environment helps people out. If I can get you away from certain environments, it, it lessens you the one of the temptation. It's easier for you to get to certain things. But if you move it away from a certain environment, it, it helps that person because it's like the temptations lessen. So you don't have to worry, you know, it keeps them from easier access to things. You understand what I mean, Ray, by that? When you look at Ward 4, is there any room for, well, I believe, I'm sure there is. Uh, you look at um, Family Dollar. Yeah. I'm sorry, save a lot that, that closed down. That's in your area, correct? No, that's Ward, that's ward 6, but that's in my area, though. Ward 6. Okay. Yeah. What businesses are in Ward 4 that, that have shut oh. down? Okay, well, in Ward 4, I have, well, just to say, be, I have still have, we have majority of, like, I have, like, the Taco Bell still going, rallies. I have uh, Young's Department Store, Smokehouse, which has been a staple of Charleston for years. I have a, do have a family family dollar, and I do have a family general, a dollar general on Washington Street going further down. I have the, uh, let's see, I think the Go-Marts. Any business have shut down. I have like a guy just opened up a um, young guy named a twenty one year old fellow man. He just opened up a um, mechanic, a car car shop, like a mechanic shop. They do work on cars. But um, in my area, like, cause the way my area is set up, like, it's like it's more, it's really more residential in the the makeup of it. But then, like, you know, you get further, like on Washington Street, like on Washington Street, there's a few, like, it's still been like storage been there for like a used appliance storage been there for years. Um, A1's been there. That's been there forever. It's been there for a long time. So pretty much, like I said, in my area, the businesses that are open have been there. And it's a strip on Washington Street that they have like the, a few empty like storefronts, but they need like some work done to them. And also have um, Powell Hardware, which has been in the West Side for Powell Hardware has been in Charleston for years too. So the good thing about it, I have some long standing, you know, uh, businesses that have been part of the city for years in my ward. And some new ones like it's trying to open some new startups and some old ones too. Has anybody reached out to you to ask uh, what type of business they want in Ward 4? Not really. I really haven't like the people, the most majority of people I get phone calls about really is just about like, you know, just homes, like the, the dilapidated homes and like, you know, just getting like the houses tore down and really just like, you know, um, uh, just like, just, like I said, really just like the houses and like, you know, um, and like, you know, like I said, and it's something like the homeless, like the homeless issue, really. But like business wise, like uh, now we did talk about like between, see, because like how it is so close, Ward, like Ward 6 and 4, we needed a grocery store. So wherever Ward it got put in, it didn't really matter because it's saying we're so close and the same demographic pretty much. And the, and the one main area of it where the store needs to be. So we're really talking about a grocery store. That's the main, that's the main thing. But stop the food desert. Larry, when we talk about uh, Ward 4, better yet, when we talk about the West Side, yeah, the first, another thing that comes to folks' mind, to the front of their mind, is crime. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel that um, what, what the West Side, especially Ward 4, do you feel that they get a, a bad rap? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. And so, I mean, like, I mean, even back when I was growing up, at one point in time, like a certain part area of where I, in the ward where I'm at now, 
it had like it had a high crime area, but it was always like certain pockets. It wouldn't spread all over the whole West Side area. And then two, a lot of stuff that happens on the West Side, people that involved in these crimes are not even from what the West Side of Charleston or even something from Charleston. And that's like that's the bad thing about it. So it gets it gets a, a brush that oh the West Side's so bad. It's not that. It's not it's not that. I mean every area has its crime. But where I live at, it gets kind of pushed more to the forefront just because of history. And then uh, you can look and you'll be like, well, I remember one time it was a, um, it was a, even on the news, it was, a, I think in St. Albans, a second, third avenue somewhere. And in St. Albans, they said, oh, Charles is West Side. But it wasn't even in the West Side, it happened somewhere else. So like the narrative is so bad about like the West Side, the West Side, the West Side. And bring it back to you again. Now, we talked about like how the West Side is broken up. Certain areas of the West Side are, well, not uh, not you know don't get viewed as that same manner like you said certain areas are not that bad but it's only my ward but that's just because of the systematic issues how it's been you know what i mean systematically so we got more of a like you said we have more you know more more problems and whatnot just because you know the systematic things have happened but it's not i mean it's not as bad i mean as people think it is like people you would think that people like have an assumption that you walk through there and if you like it's like like war zone 1995 of South Central Los Angeles. And that's not the that's not the case. But do we have our problems? Yes, we do. But I mean, it's not like you can't walk through the West Side and you know people will be like, oh my gosh, you know, it's gonna you're gonna get carjacked if you go into the go mart or if you stop at Taco Bell, somebody's gonna mug you. It's not like that at all. Larry, we have unpacked everything as far as Ward 4. Yes, sir. I appreciate you for that. No problem. Now, I got one last question. Again, you're running for re-election. Yes, sir. Okay. I gave Jennifer Farr three minutes. I'm going to give you four minutes. Okay. You tell the viewers and listeners why they should vote for Larry Moore. You ready? Yes, sir. I'm ready, though. No. All, right. All right. Go. Okay. Why you should vote for me is that I am totally invested into uplifting our community. Like I said, my whole slogan is to change the narrative. So the narrative is, as Ray said, the West Side of Charleston, when you hear that, people be like, no, I don't want to move there. I don't want to come there. No, it's not that. There's some wonderful people over there, man. The West Side is a great spot. And I want to make my constituents see and feel good. And I want people to come into my, to my ward and better my ward. Because the people we bring into the ward, it betters it. And like I said, I just want to make, a, I want to ward for when you speak Ward 4, I want it to be a shining example of hope. Because prime example, Ward 4 is where we had 2nd Avenue Center. And we had a young man recently passed away, John Brown. He started a whole basketball league called the Jungle. And when you would come over there, it was people from all over the state of West Virginia on the west side of Charleston. And a notorious part of the west side of Charleston. But now them people coming and seeing, it's not what it is. It's uplifting. And I just want to uplift and my people, I want everybody to, I want to just make the West Side just like great, you know, and I want to just change the narrative and I want to fix everything what people say about us. And I just want that, the whole area to be, to be booming, blossoming, blossoming, you know, like I said, I, I want to, it's like, I, I would just want to, to get back to the days of just like neighbor, like everybody in the community helping each other, looking out for each other. And I, I mean, I just really want to, because Whatever, like I said, when the West Side is good, it's good for the city of Charleston. And it's like, you know, because like I said, I live in an area that is, like I said, it's a convenient area. It's a good spot to be to. You're close to downtown. You're close, like there's bus routes. So my ward, it's a great ward. And I just want to change that narrative about people like not wanting to come there. Because what happens is this, when my, my neighborhood is doing good, the school changes good. The school system does great. Because like, I have Mary C. Snow in my, in my ward. So, like I said, the more families we get in, the better, like, you know, as people move in, it builds up everything. Like, I like, to, you know, saying this, I just want to change the narrative. I just want to see my, just like this, to change this narrative of people. When they say the West Side, they say Ward 4. I want to just change the smile on their face. Like, that's the place I want to live. I want to come. And I just want to say, I'm here to help people. I just want to see people be great. That's just my thing. Larry, I'm done. Okay. You, we have unpacked everything, and then okay. you tied it all together, put a little, a nice red bow on it, not purple or yellow. <laughs> purple and gold? P purple and yellow. 
Just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give you grief, man. I'm, hey, it's all right. It's it's all in fun, man. It's all in fun. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Again, I mean, I, again, I, 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 I mean, no disrespect to Omega Sun oh. Fraternity. Oh, I know, I know. It's all love. It's all in jest, man. Huh? This is all in jest, man. It's all in jest. Yes, yes, yes. And again, uh, Bobby and I, again, you know, we we go back and forth for for a number of years and everything. So. <laughs> Uh, that's my that's my dude right there, man. Hey, Bob, I, Bob, yeah, Bob is a great man. He's a great man. The, the only man. thing, only one bad thing I said about him. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> that, that, that's it. Nothing. I mean, really. I mean, I'll tell you, Bobby is solid, man. He's one of the best men I've I've ever met in my life, man. Solid, yes. man. Solid. Yes, man. yes, solid. yes. Well, look here, man. Uh, you take. Oh, by, by the way, are you having a kickoff campaign? Yeah, yeah, because like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie to this, man, because I'm so new to this. I'm so green. So like, I've been trying to get my stuff together. So I'm going to have like a, I'm going to let you know. So I'm trying to get a kick, like a campaign kickoff like next week. I was going to do one this week, but I had to, um, because where I've been so busy and I got to get my uh, stuff together. And I was like, I'm, I'm a new, I'm, like I said, I'm a newbie because like I, I'm trying to get my campaign stuff together. And but one thing I do have, I got great people around me. So you're only good people you surround yourself with. So I got a great crew of people helping me out. So I'm trying to get my campaign kickoff next week. So I'm trying to get that going because I'm I'm kind of behind everybody, I think. So I need to get back. I need to get, get kicking into fifth gear and get caught up a little bit. Okay. You say you're a newbie. Okay. Now I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you right now, the, the correct term is say, I'm a neophyte. Just, just say that. <laughs> I'm, I'm a neo fight in this uh I'm a neo fight in this, in this uh election process. I know that for sure. So there you I'm, go. There you but, go. But I'm but I'm going to but I'm saying I'm a quick learner. I'm a quick I'm a quick lady. Uh, I learn quick and I, and I jump on top of stuff. So I'm going to make sure I get get caught up and be ready to go. All right. Hey Larry Moore. Hey, thank you very much. Buford Lloyd. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Take so much care, man. Yes, sir. All thank right. you for having me, sir. Yes, sir. All right.